So I would like to uh, begin by acknowledging that the land in which we are gathered tonight is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, including the territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. This um, recognition of us gathered here on the unceded territories is important to us as, a, as an immigrant serving agency. We have been working now for over a decade trying to um, um, increase the awareness of Indigenous peoples of Canada uh, to newcomers. And, and uh, so we are involved in a number of different initiatives related to this um, uh, as we embark down this road of reconciliation. Um, as an organization, we feel strongly that as the number of immigrants and refugees are coming to Canada, um, many, if not most, have no understanding of Indigenous peoples of this country. And so that is part of our leadership role that we are, um, have been embarking on. Um, we have a hashtag uh, for those that are involved in social media uh, tonight. It's called hashtag closer look 2019. So why are we doing this? Why is an immigrant serving agency who's been delivering a variety of services and programs for close to 50 years now, taking a closer look? For us, the, this issue um, that many of us work in um, can best be described as an echo chamber. We're involved with newcomers day in and day out. We are curious as to the impact and outcomes of our work but we are wanting to learn more and understanding the dynamics of immigration to help us uh, better improve the services that we do. So this was our attempt in this series to take us out of our echo chamber um, by inviting keynote speakers from various uh, members of civil society to help us around defining all of the dynamics that are related to immigration. Immigration in Canada, considering the importance of it, is not widely discussed. I mean, yes, during the most recent election, but overall, it is not widely discussed. Other countries, like Australia as an example, have had white papers, or the equivalent of royal commissions on immigration, that really bring together a variety of civil society to talk about uh, immigration in a meaningful way. In this country, most people do not understand or not aware of that uh, it is every November 1st when the Minister of uh, Immigration stands up in the House of Commons to announce the immigration targets of the next year. This is done through a very, you know, I think inadequate um, consultation process given the vast importance of immigration on this country. Under the Liberal government was the first time that we actually saw multi-year immigration levels, and this is of great importance to community, to be able to plan in advance. And those levels, depending on what happens under the minority government, um, are expected to increase to close to 400,000 by 2022. We have been, um, um, this, this uh, evening was also an opportunity of thank you and welcome to the neighborhood. We've been in this facility now for three years. Uh, it's surprising how quickly it goes by. But it was a way of ensuring or engaging our neighbors to, to better understand what we're doing behind these walls. And so for those of you who are joining us from the neighborhood, a special welcome to you. And, and we hope that all of you that had the opportunity to uh, participate in a tour prior to the, this evening's event um, are leaving with um, a more appreciation or insight into the, the work that we do. Today, this evening, we're talking about refugee claimants. We call them refugee claimants. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as asylum seekers. Terminology is important, and, and, and uh, we have been working with refugee claimants now, as well as specialized individuals and agencies represented in the audience for many years. 
What has struck us in the past five years, we have seen a 360 degree increase in the number of refugee claimants that are coming to British Columbia. So whereas the, the majority of the public discourse and the media has focused on um, activities in Ontario, Quebec, at Rockham Road, Roxham Road, um, we have been seeing uh, and working quietly behind the scenes to one of the highest levels of refugee claimants um, in, in recent times. On average, as well, we're ha um, helping to support um, um, in various housing op options, both sh emergency, short-term, and permanent, over 90 refugee claimants every month, this being their most challenging um, service support. We're well on our way uh, this year uh, to see close to 4,500 unique refugee claimants, of which 60% are entering over the U.S. border through irregular means. And they are coming uh, both as individuals and an, as, as families uh, near the Peace Arch Park, but also those that are already in Canada with certain legal status that are converting that status and seeking asylum. Because of the sheer numbers and the volume of refugee claimants, um, the, the system has created a significant backlog. And so for an individual that claims asylum in this country, in this region, it's taking upwards of 16, 18 or more months um, to get a resolution to their asylum. Well, the election is over, and as we expected, immigration uh, was used by various political parties to encourage or incite their base. And on the one hand, we saw Andrew Shears undertake a press conference uh, in Quebec on Roxham Road to draw attention to irregular arrivals. This is a pattern that has uh, precipitated over the last number of years as the number of refugee claimants has arrived. Ha and this has confused the public and has created a significant negative discourse in, in our work and working with claimants. So on the one hand, we have um, Andrew Scheer and the Conservative Party who have been um, incorrectly um, drawing attention to some aspects of the ir irregular arrivals. <clears throat> and on the other hand, we had Elizabeth May from the Green Party um, as part of the Green Party platform talking about environmental refugees and is it time for Canada to accept environmental refugees. In the midst of the election, uh, the Angus Reid uh, Institute undertook a public opinion poll this public opinion poll was <clears throat> re released on October 7th, and not surprising to my colleagues across the country, um, they, found, they found, the poll found um, confusion and significant misperceptions among people in Canada about how many immigrants actually settle in this country over a year and where in the world they come from. Canadians also overestimate the number who come as refugees and underestimate the number who arrive as economic class immigrants. For example, two thirds of Canadians, 64% say that Canada accepts most of its immigrants from the Middle East and North Africa. This region actually represents about 12% of Canada's immigration. Canadians also overestimate the percentage of refugees the country accepts by double while underestimating those entering as economic class. I think it's important to understand and recognize that uh, refugees, you know, have a right to make a claim for asylum. This is built on Canada's international obligations and, and reinforced by our Supreme Court which has ruled that the Charter of Rights and Freedom guarantee the rights of refugee claimants to fundamental justice and the right to an oral hearing of their claim. 
for those of you that are interested in, in understanding and learning more about refugee claimants that are arriving in British Columbia, I want to put, I want to uh, point out to you that ISSBC released in June 2018 a report um, called Understanding Current Irregular Arrival Trends. This report um, interviewed uh, over 300 refugee claimant households, representing at this time close to 50% of refugee claimants that are arrived um, uh, from uh, October 2016 to December 2017. Um, and really provides insight uh, uh, through a 40-question survey on, on um, the experience of refugee claimants seeking asylum here in British Columbia. Um, what was um, of curiosity to us was the fact that most of the claimants that, that have, were seen during this time period had um, used, intentionally entered into the United States under legal mechanisms, but used the United States as a transit point uh, and, and uh, flying from um, New York and other cities in the eastern coast to, the, to Seattle and then walking across. So again, very different characteristics than those that have um, been um, arriving through irregular means in Quebec and Ontario. We haven't seen um, those that were fl fleeing as a result of uh, Donald Trump's um, suspension of the temporary protection agreement on certain ethnicities. Um, the other thing that we learned was that the human capital of refugee claimants was significantly higher than we imagined. So dealing with uh, professionals, well-educated, senior managers, um, uh, those that had uh, uh, self-employment in the past, um, healthcare uh, professionals, um, et cetera, and also had uh, fairly significant high levels of English. So tremendous human capital. Um, we also discovered that uh, quite a number had found work. Um, in fact, 57% of respondents were employed in Canada at the time of the sur survey on either a full-time, um, uh, part-time, or on-call basis. So they are making the most of their situation as they await the outcome of their asylum. Um, but this is what the public doesn't understand or, or, or um, um, you know, understand or uh, appreciate is the tremendous diversity of refugee claimants that are entering this country. We're also seeing those coming from over or close to 50 different source countries. The number one source country over the past year are those that have been coming from Iran, as an example. And that has been consistent, by and large, over the past 12 months. So Canadians are uncomfortable with refugee claimants. They're not part of the orderly migration system um, where we find uh, resettled refugees, economic class, or family class. This is part of, I think, the, the, the turmoil in some of the public opinions and misconceptions and negative discourse. But as I pointed out, they do have a right. We have signed international obligations and covenants to ensure that they have the ability, without being penalized, to seek asylum, to obtain a hearing, um, and, and, uh, and the outcome of that hearing. So this report, I said, is available on our website under reports and publications if you want to uh, dig deeper into this topic of refugee claimants. I'd like to now introduce um, uh, the moderator of tonight's session. Erin Glanville uh, has a PhD from McMaster's and is currently a Social Science and Humanities Research Council postdoctoral fellow in the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University, and also lectures at the University of British Columbia. Her current research is a knowledge mobilization project on the public discourse of contemporary asylum dialogues in Canada 
and is done in conversation with Kimbrace Community Society. Kimbrace is a local uh, um, community organization that has been working for a number of years um, providing uh, refugee claimants housing and other support services. She runs community workshops shaped by her doctoral research on refugee fiction and is currently writing on teaching cultural refugee studies. She is also the author of Countering Displacement, the editor, sorry, of Countering Displacement. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Erin. Um, thanks so much to ISSFVC for organizing this conversation. Um, I do research at SFU, but I'm actually also here as a neighbor. So I am part of the neighborhood here, and I recognize some of you from the neighborhood. It's really nice to be here uh, as local people, um, as well as those who have come from further away to have this conversation. So thanks for, to ISS for hosting us and having this conversation. Um, I remember the center going up or hearing that it was going to go up and being very excited about it as um, a neighbor and just grateful for your work and uh, maybe a special um, note of appreciation for some of your frontline workers who I've actually interviewed and spoken with who uh, do that sort of day-to-day, face-to-face uh, work of supporting people as they go through integration processes, um, bureaucratic processes. And we're going to uh, hear from Catherine very shortly, so I'm just going to say a couple of things. Um, and just to say that as we uh, enter into dialogue and in some of my research interviews, one of I've asked this question about dialogue because we wonder how do you create good dialogue and some of the feedback that I've got, we've got lots of statistics and then sometimes we forget the, the personal, the person whose, whose story it is that, that walks through those statistics and lives that, lives that out. And I've heard feedback from uh, people about what is important in listening in a conversation and dialogue. And it's been surprising to me. It's been about curiosity and having thinking the best of the person that you speak to, but being curious and being willing to ask straight questions. So I just encourage us to enter into this dialogue with that uh, spirit. Um, and also to say the land acknowledgement as a, a way of centering our relationships, history of our relationships and also our present relationships is a good place to start for making sure that those, those pieces are on the table as we begin speaking. Um, so we're privileged to have Dr. Catherine Deverne here. Uh, Dr. Deverne has been doing research in this area so long that her bio can talk about decades and quarter centuries. So she, we are in good hands uh, tonight. Um, and after her talk, we'll have a, a short time for Q&A too. So hold on to your questions. Uh, Dr. Deverne is the Dean of UBC's Peter A. Allard School of Law and has been working in the area of refugee, immigration, and citizenship law over the past quarter of a century. And for a decade, she was also the Canada Research Chair in Migration Law. Dr. Deverne has contributed to popular conversations as well, and so was recognized in 2012 for that uh, as a fellow of the Trudeau, Trudeau Foundation in between the two Trudeau prime ministers. Um, she's written three books that explain the theoretical underpinnings of uh, refugee and citizenship law, including thinking about human rights and the way that fits with refugee claims. Deverne is also an editor or co-author of four other volumes, and much of her work uh, engages feminist critiques of law. So we're having a conversation in the front here about the place of women in immigration. So this is a particular area of concern for her. And currently, she's working with a couple of colleagues, Ben Gould and Efrat Arbel, on a, another project uh, related to, um, well, I'll read the title of it, Finding a Place for Rights, an Independent Evaluation of the Impact of the Beyond the Border Initiative on Human Rights at the Canada-US border. So join me in welcoming Catherine Deverne. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very um, graceful and generous introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited by the Immigrant Services Society of BC to speak in this series, in this fantastic world-leading venue. And ISS of BC has a very long and proud history of serving newcomers to Canada and to Vancouver. And anyone who works as a scholar or a lawyer in this part of the world has long admired the important work that happens here. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here this evening. Um, I want to talk uh, this evening mostly about why refugee claims matter. And the answer to this question 
and I'm going to try and speed it up a bit given that I've already taxed your patience. Um, the answer to this question lies in the space between compassion and law. And that's the space I want to spend some time mapping in the first instance. And then I want to uh, finish up by talking about why there's so much political noise in this space and what the noise looks like, say, just this week in Canada as an example. So that's the plan. And, uh, and then I'm very happy at the end to, uh, to take questions and hope that there will be answers to them. But uh, that's not always the case. So one of the most important achievements of international human rights protection is that there is an international definition of who is a refugee and that this definition is accepted by 147 countries around the world. That's truly a remarkable achievement. There is very, very little international law that has this kind of breadth of acceptance. So here's the definition, just as a reminder. Some people in, the, in this room will have spent their entire lives working on this, and others might be thinking about it for the first time or for a new time. But a refugee is a person who is, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion, is outside of the country of his or her nationality and is unable or, owing to that fear, unwilling to avail themselves of the protection of that country. So persecution is a linchpin, and then there are those five specific grounds. Now, we know this definition isn't perfect. It leaves out a whole lot of people who really do need very, very seriously and very urgently need to be protected somewhere in the world and who can't find that protection at home. But in the 58 years since this definition has come along, it has proven both adaptable and really, really resilient. So a couple of examples are useful to pause at there. On the question of resilience, in the face of massive opposition among prosperous Western countries to people seeking asylum, there is not a single country that has withdrawn from the Refugee Convention. And it's entirely possible to do that. And lots of countries, lots of prosperous Western countries, in fact, do either not sign up to international human rights instruments in the first place, or they withdraw from them when the going gets tough, or they file a derogation just to withdraw from the parts that are particularly sticky or difficult to deal with. Nobody's done that with the Refugee Convention. States have complained about it over time. They have objected to its infringement of the, on their sovereignty, but despite doing all sorts of other things to get away from the heft of international refugee law, Western governments have stood behind the idea that there is such a thing as international refugee law and that it is worth treating as a legal obligation. So that's, a, that's like the gold standard for international law. And international refugee law has been extraordinarily adaptable. And I think the best example here really is women. So I read you that definition. There was no mention of women, no mention of gender. And really, I think amongst uh, the conventions drafters who were sitting around the table in the late 1940s in the aftermath of World War II, they really did not have gender-related persecution at the top of their minds, probably didn't have even the vocabulary to think about gender-related persecution. And yet, the refugee definition has adapted uh, very uh, effectively, not in every case correctly, but very effectively to the idea of gender-related persecution. And I think even more recently, um, the persecution of sexualized minorities in the LGBTQ community has been able to uh, really push the development of this law into a creative and very important new space and to recognize persecution of sexual minority communities around the world. So we have an adaptable and resilient piece of law which is at the center. So the refugee convention is itself, or the refugee definition is itself embedded in a convention 
that is full of many other rights statements for refugees. Some of them are very basic human rights statements. Some of them are sophisticated, advanced statements about work rights and citizenship rights and national treatment, all those sorts of things. Um, even for those of us in the room who've been working in this area for a really long time, we would probably be hard pressed to enumerate more than about five or 10 of the 32 rights statements that are in there. And I think that's because it's fair to say that these other rights have not gotten nearly as much traction as the definition itself, which is remarkably well respected. So why is that? It's partially because of this gap between compassion and the law. Um, and the idea of agreeing upon a definition of who is a refugee is much, much easier for states than the secondary step of recognizing a robust on the ground set of socioeconomic rights that give people full access to a robust way of moving their lives forward. So setting that set of rights aside, which one really never ought to do, and yet I'm going to repeat what states do over and over, I want to come back and talk about how it is that this definition is actually used. So there are two ways in which the refugee definition is important. One is in the area of refugee resettlement. So refugee resettlement, the definition is applied overseas somewhere often by the UNHCR, but sometimes by another government or another agency. And on the basis of fitting within that definition, a person is allowed to move to a third country. Um, and uh, refugee resettlement in that, a uh, refugee definition in that setting um, is often not highly legalized. There often are not um, lawyers involved. There are often not uh, layers and layers of appeal. Um, I had a graduate student once uh, who actually just has a new book out. Let me give a plug to Shauna Labman's book on Canada's resettlement system, which was published last week. Um, uh, but her interest in refugee resettlement sprung from the experience of uh, the month after she finished law school, going to work for UNHCR as an intern in Delhi, where somebody said to her, wow, you've been to law school. This is fabulous. Here's the refugee definition. Could you read it this afternoon? And the next day, you will make six determinations. You will be the person who decides what will happen to six different individuals and families. And you will be our best decision maker because you know the law. So. Um, I have no doubt that she was pretty good at that work, but it is a daunting task to take on. Um, so that's how refugee, that's how the definition is used in the resettlement context. And then there is asylum seeking. So the core of the asylum process is that an individual gets to another country somehow, refugee law doesn't tell us how, and the convention that, yeah, you just have to kind of make that, that part up, hold your breath, you get there, you use a magic wand or, you know, some, something. Hopefully you don't go in a container ship, but um, that's top of mind this week right now. So you somehow get somewhere, and then the convention provides that seeking asylum, if you arrive at the border of a country that has signed up to international refugee law and you're seeking asylum, that country has to let you in and they have to somehow make a decision about your status. And this is a genuine restriction on state sovereignty. There is no other way that somebody who is not a citizen has an unassailable right to cross a border. Okay? And Western countries are, um, uh, you know, Western countries grant people all sorts of permissions short of citizenship, permanent residency, or work visas, or study permits, or all sorts of other things. But all of those things are completely discretionary, and there's absolutely nothing in international law that requires any country to let in anybody who is not a citizen or somebody seeking asylum, somebody wanting to make a refugee claim. So what we see in this setting is that resettlement is a system that relies completely on compassion. And asylum is a system that relies completely on the law. So I want to take a look at this distinction a little bit further. In a given year now, 
about 800,000 people somewhere around the world get asylum every year. So, you know, not bad. It's over a million sometimes, under a million sometimes, goes up and down a little bit. In a very, very good year, by contrast, about 100,000 people will be resettled somewhere in the world. Okay. So those numbers are not insignificant, but it's important to keep them in a global context. At present, there are about 25.9 million people in the world, according to the UN Refugees Agency, the UNHCR, who can be considered to be refugees, who presumptively, it's not that the UNHCR has gone out and made 26 million determinations, um, but that they are, so it's almost always an underrepresentation because they put forward a number that they're really sure about, uh, and this is their 2018 figure. And in addition to that 25.9 million figure, there are also 70.8 million people who are persons of concern to the UNHCR, which means either they might be refugees, but they might have more complicated cases, or that they're certainly not refugees, but they're actually in need of urgent human rights protection somewhere. So that's a big number. And it's even bigger when we think that in 2015, which is just a blink ago, uh, this number was released in the middle of our 2015 federal election campaign, the number I'm about to say, which is 20 million. So four years ago, the UN Refugee Agency sent out a global alarm call, bells and whistles, extra heavy press releases, many more people speaking in Geneva, that the number of refugees in the world in 2015 had surpassed 20 million for the very first time since the Second World War. Now, it's not the case that the number has only gotten higher since then. There's a little dip down in 2017. But the number is now almost um, 6 million people higher than that. So back in 2015, Canada answered that call. The Trudeau government, some of you may recall this during the previous election campaign, the Trudeau the Younger, as we think of him, his government massively stepped up resettlement numbers. Um, and that resulted in 2015 to nearly doubling the Harper era figure and moving to uh, 20,031 resettlements in 2015. Okay, so, so that's um, just 25.9 million on one hand. 2015, we have, remember how, how, hard, how hard we worked and how proud we were of ourselves? That was 20,031 people officially resettled in 2015. And in 2016, a much larger number because you will recall that that push went on through January, February, and to the end of March. Um, 46,704 people were resettled in Canada in 2016. That was a great year. I thought at the time, gosh, we might be just at the beginning of something that sustains this or increases it. We are now back in every year since then to something a little bit closer to 25,000 annually. Meanwhile, in the United States, there was also a government change in 2016. Um, and the United States has since that date moved from being the world's resettlement leader to doing less and less and less. And we may yet see where the bottom of that barrel can actually be scraped. So they went from a, a target of 75,000 resettled uh, resettlement places in, 20, in 2016 or prior to that election to in 2017, 53,000, in 2018, 22,500, in 2019, a hard cap of 30,000, and just announced for next year, for 2020, a new low cap of 18,000 resettlement places. This will be the lowest number since 1980, which was the first year that the United States joined up to international refugee law. So probably that means the lowest number ever, or at least the lowest number that we can piece together, because throughout the 1970s, the statistics are kept in such different ways in the United States that we're never going to be able to ascertain what's going on inside that black box. 
So I want to come back to the scope of the world. In refugee resettlement terms, if we round the number down from 25.9 million to 25 million, this is just because I'm not really good at math and because the point I'm going to make is so blunt that you don't need to be really good at math. And if we round the resettlement figure up to 100,000, which is, as I said, a really fabulously good year because Canada does it, the United States does it, Australia does some but less, and then occasionally a few Nordic countries will come up to a number that maybe has four digits, maybe, not always. Um, and uh, on the BBC on Monday evening this week, I saw that uh, Rwanda was taking resettled, refugees being resettled from camps in Libya, and that is the, that is, um, really an interesting and important thing, but since Monday evening I've not had time to re research that further, so perhaps we can take that on um, as a group. So 25 million, we've rounded that down. 100,000, we've rounded that up. It would take 250 years at this rate for all of these people to be resettled. If nobody else ever needed help, if none of these people ever had children, if only it were possible for people to live that long. If we just started a concerted campaign to resettle these people, we would soon reach the end of potential resettlement um, because people's lifespans are not long enough to allow for that to happen. So clearly, our contemporary resettlement system, while incredibly valuable and absolutely life-changing, is in its current form woefully inadequate. And that's the compassion part of the story. There just is not anywhere near enough. Now, the vast majority of people who are refugees in the world are, of course, in the global south. And the prosperous states of the global north have used the full extent of the law to build barriers that make it very hard for people to seek asylum to access the core promise of refugee law. So here are some examples, carrier sanctions. That's uh, when an airline or a shipping company is fined if they end up bringing um, somebody seeking asylum into another country. Uh, visas, it's not possible anywhere in the world except for in a couple of Swiss cantons to actually get a visa to seek asylum as opposed to um, enter the country for some other reason. Um, and uh, finally, a safe third country um, the third thing on the list is a safe third country agreement. So a safe third country agreement is an agreement between two countries, just say Canada and the United States, for example, or a group of countries like the EU that says, actually, we're not going to allow people to cross our borders in order to seek asylum, that people will seek protection in the first place that they arrive. And this is the same kind of agreement um, that the United States has just imposed moving along its southern border. So all of these devices are different advices, d different devices to limit this refugee claims. So the very improbability or ridiculousness or implausibility in the world of asylum is the precise reason why resettlement remains very, very important. Resettlement's not a legal act. It's not required by law. It uses the law, but there's no requirement. Not now, maybe someday. Accordingly, people who are seeking to save themselves and their families to make better or even just possible lives for themselves flee their countries of nationality or those countries that border their countries of nationality and they come directly to Western states. And this is where we come back to my central uh, point this evening. Refugee claims are important because they offer people a chance at a new life, most likely the only chance they're ever going to get at a new life. There is no other alternative. There's no queue that can be joined unless you think about the 250-year potential wait list as something that is orderly or could be a queue. It's not. And there's no option to simply wait it out and think that if you wait around somewhere, um, that help will come to you. There are only a few of the 26 million refugees in the world who actually can make it to a place where they can claim refugee status. And that's why it's these claims are so important. A refugee claim is a legal claim. There's lots of laws surrounding it. It's not about compassion, which is never quite enough. It's a core matter of state responsibility. 
So the politics surrounding this responsibility is confusing. Um, and it conflates law and compassion to deliberately obscure what's going on here. And it's against the backdrop of uh, this recently concluded election, the election concluded this week, that I'd like to talk a little bit about Canada's safe third country agreement with the United States. So first of all, what does this agreement do? It means, it says, that if you arrive in the United States first, you claim asylum in the United States. And if you arrive in Canada first, you claim asylum in Canada. And the general principle of the agreement is you're not to cross that border between Canada and the US to claim asylum on the other side. It applies primarily at uh, the land border, so official border posts at the land border. And it does not apply at, uh, for clandestine crossings or for people who fly into the country. So you fly into the country, obviously you have a little more money. So that's what the agreement does. Canada wanted it for a very long time, obviously because the number of people in the United States was much higher. The US wasn't interested in this agreement at all until the terror attacks of 9-11. And then the US became very motivated to sign the agreement because they thought, aha, we can control the entire system for North America. So then it was appealing. Then the, polit the political drivers in the two countries um, were motivated in the same direction at that time, and the agreement followed soon after those 2001 attacks. So what is the problem with the Safe Third Country Agreement that has uh, attracted so much political profile in Canada? The problem is that it forces people into clandestine border crossings because it prevents people crossing the land border at regular border posts, the Safe Third Country Agreement has led to a massive upsurge in clandestine border crossings into Canada from the United States. And this almost didn't happen at all prior to this agreement coming into effect in 2004. It is a brand new thing. And it has had a massive uptick recently why? Because of that thing that happened in the United States in 2016, which has made an environment which is considerably more hostile to people making refugee claims um, even worse. So it was already a worse situation than Canada, and now it's really, really awful, is the most polite way I can uh, talk about that. So I could, um, I could say a little bit more about that, but I'm I'm mindful of trying to hurry up because I was so late. So I want to, uh, one of the things that I've been doing over the past 40 days or so is I've been tracking what Canada's political leaders have been saying during this election campaign about immigration and refugee issues. And uh, it's actually been like uh, kind of depressing, but it's a professional responsibility to track these things nonetheless. And let's just pull out of this mass a few things that have been said. So um, Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party promised to modernize the safe third country agreement with the United States. A little vague. We, it's not particularly old fashioned, this agreement, but modernize, that's the promise. Um, the Conservative Party, this is Andrew Scheer speaking, promises to close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement that allows some people to skip the line and avoid the queue. So uh, the loophole being presumably the fact that you can walk across uh, the border as long as you avoid a border crossing. But as I've mentioned before, there's no line and there's no queue. And all that that um, uh, loophole does is actually allow people to cross in much more dangerous uh, situations and have much less support. Uh, then we come to the NDP, um, who promise to suspend the safe third country agreement with the United States and allow people to make claims at official border crossings. So I actually like that one. Um, but not quite as much as the Green Party, which I think their whole platform was not really robust enough, but this part of it was really cool. Terminate Canada's safe third country agreement with the United States. Simple, effective, why did we not all vote Green? Again, let's just be clear about that. Now, I'm sure that Maxime Bernier had something to say about this. Immigration was really central to that platform, but I'm really pleased to be able to confirm that the Canadian electorate found him to be utterly irrelevant. And I think for that, 
we can actually really be proud of ourselves um, locally, nationally. I think this is this is one of the best, most positive reflections of Canadianness that I can see lately. Um, but coming back to the point about the election campaign and the safe third country agreement, where you see um, on that menu really the whole range of possibilities. But the saddest thing about this is it is really almost the only thing in the refugee space that was talked about during the election campaign. There was a tiny little frizzen here and there of a not even promises, but just occasionally a mention. But it is so different from the 2015 campaign where it, we actually saw the beginning of a debate in this country about the thing that is not law, but instead compassion. And which therefore, although the law has been flexible and adaptable, compassion is like infinitely malleable. And as you know, because you work in this space, in this sector, um, the capacity of people whose compassion is triggered is really pretty infinite. That a lot of people who work in this sector who step up to do things for people who are refugees or refugee claimants or needing asylum, actually people do a little bit and then they do a little bit more and then they do a little bit more. Um, so. I'm going to stop talking about the Safe Third Country Agreement if you are really interested in it. I do have the capacity to go on at length. But I want to come back to this idea about compassion because I actually think compassion is easier to fundamentally shift than the law. And one of the things that is really curious and vitally important is that every single Western state, every single Western liberal democracy reserves for itself within the context of its immigration and refugee law legal framework the capacity to make humanitarian exceptions. There's not a legal system, not even the American legal system, that doesn't allow for the fact that when you get very close to individual people in need, you want to be able to make an exception and allow people in or allow them to stay. And so the framework of this law is really unusual. We don't have another kind of law where there is a space for exceptions and where the space for exceptions, every time it gets pared down, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. So in Canada, this system within our immigration law is recognized as the, the capacity to make humanitarian and compassionate applications for an exception to anything that is in our, the immigration law text. Now, it's um, through the Harper government years that that space for humanitarian and compassionate exceptions got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But each time it was shrunk down, the number of people pushed into that space would over time get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And I think there's something really important here um, that is worth thinking about is worth advocating about, is worth actually just having a hopeful moment about because goodness knows there aren't really nearly enough hopeful moments. So faced with actual human beings rather than abstractions who are statistics who are in a camp in Dadaab, Western states actually understand the human base need to do things and help other human beings. And we just have to cling to that and use it as much as we possibly can. So uh, that's one thing that I think we've got is this compassion piece, which is easier to shift than the law. And the other thing um, that uh, I think it's important to advocate for is better cooperation around making asylum possible and expanding and expanding and expanding resettlement. And in some ways, these two pieces are what is at the heart of the new um, Global Compact on Refugees that was agreed on in December last year, so less than a year ago. And the Global Compact is really premised on the idea that actually we don't need more law um, and we're not likely to be able to get more international law. But we could really get two things if we collaborated broadly internationally. 
One of those things is a dramatic increase in the amount of resettlement around the world. And the other thing is a much more, a more secure path and many more paths for people to actually try and seek asylum to exercise that legal right. And uh, along with many other people, I was kind of disappointed that the Global Compact for Refugees did not just come out and say something like resettlement figures will be, I don't know, you could just pick a number, increase tenfold, twentyfold, double, like you could go for anything, right? Like every resettlement place is a meaningful place for somebody. Um, and so initially I was uh, discouraged by that, but in the absence of hard law, which we're unlikely to get in our current political climate, the idea that we could use the tool that we have, on the one hand, the compassion, and on the other hand, the law that gives us an asylum system, and really try to work to expand both of those things um, would be a very meaningful contribution. So um, I will close there. Uh, happy to take questions. I'm happy to come and sit down. Yeah. Sure. So thanks so much for that talk. I'll pour you a bit of water. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, coming into this talk, I was appreciating that you're gonna bring together compassion and law, because I think sometimes even the way we communicate, it's often about, well, we wanna have compassion, but no, we need to be fair. And that they kind of get pulled apart, right? We're either being fair and sticking with the law, or we're gonna care for people. And I'm um, really interested to hear you say compassion is a strength, like to see that as a powerful thing. Yeah, um, so I wonder, I'm just, we're gonna open it up to questions, so think about what question you might like to ask. I'll just ask an initial one and then we'll open it up and I'll come around. Um, this is more a bit of a practical question actually, is just, uh, you, you talked about clinging to compassion. Yeah. And so I just wondered, can you flesh that out for us practically, what, what that might look like, you know, embedding compassion in law or, you know, practically for us and thinking about how, how do we do that, you know? Um, Excellent, thank you. I, I, I mean, I don't think this is hard for uh, an advocacy community at ISS of BC. I think that, um, and I think that there is actually quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of law in Canada which is built directly on this compassionate principle. And you know, for for whatever difficulties there are around private sponsorship of refugees, private sponsorship is actually the place where these two things uh, are really tied together very, very closely. But I think in terms of how do we advocate around compassion, the complicated piece there is, I think, to keep reminding people of their humanity and keep reminding people that we are uh, advocating to, that we are making representations to, that in fact the bare legal minimum isn't enough and that the law exists as a, as a sort of bottom, like a, an absolute minimum requirement and that we are never going to solve this problem if we don't do more than that. And I think, um, uh, you know, I think one of the most interesting things that, that for a time, um, globally cast these issues in different light was actually uh, the number of people fleeing Syria in 2015, 2016, who actually managed to make it to prosperous Western states. You know, usually the, uh, usually the most dramatic flows of refugees are really conveniently distant in the global south and people in prosperous Western states actually, those people are never close enough to them to actually trigger that compassion. And I think we had a moment there, and I think we saw a Canadian political response to that as well as a personal response. And I think continuing to remind political leaders of that and remind them that actually individual Canadians were on the whole pretty happy with that response, very willing to step up. A huge number of people did all sorts of, of different things. Um, and, and reminding leaders of that. Um, I lived for many years in Australia, which is um, 
like a totally other universe in terms of protecting uh, refugees. And there was a very successful campaign where people actually got signs and put them in their houses when they were, there, when they were campaigning against um, mandatory detention of asylum seekers arriving in Australia. People actually opened their homes and said, this person can stay here instead of in detention. And they would put up signs, kind of like those old block parent signs. Um, my children are adults, so I've forgotten about whether that still exists anymore. Um, and eventually, the Australian government let people out of detention to stay with people in the community. Not everyone, not a huge number of people, and with a huge amount of fanfare and whatnot. But responding to that, to just individuals saying, I would have this person in my house until you make a decision about them, rather than shipping them off to the desert somewhere. And those gestures, particularly as they generate a large scale, are actually things that move politicians, not always, but you know, often more than legal arguments. Well, just invite any questions, um, curiosities or challenges, or you know, you know, anything that you would like to ask. I about. can't promise I any answer, but I'm happy to hear any question. Okay, all right, we've got one here and one there. We'll take two, and then sure. uh, you can ask them both. Um, after the war in Afghanistan, like there were millions of refugees that entered Pakistan, um, and in in African countries, like if you know, Rwanda took so many uh, refugees and uh, started integrating them, uh, introduced program that makes things easier for them. So these poor countries, third world countries, and they are taking people in millions and is still somehow able to manage it. And over here, we are sitting in one of the most richest countries in the world. And we are talking about uh, how compassion looks like for 20,000 or 30,000 or 40,000 refugees that we are taking. Yes, why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I think that's just luxury. You know, I think um, one of the things that happens in uh, Afghanistan and, and the Pakistani border is partially this happens in Western countries because Western countries are really unique globally in that they actually have a huge amount of state capacity and they have the capacity to close their borders. So for states that are really proximate to failed states or to extensive uh, civil strife, they don't have the capacity very often to actually close the border. And so millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people will come across the border and it turns out that those states somehow cope. And that has a lot to do with, um, uh, that is you know, partially about compassion and partially about just actually not having a choice. And it is one of the reasons why uh, 2015 was so different, not different enough that it carried people along. But yes, of course, there's um, a huge amount to be learned for, for Western states from just looking at the experiences of many, many states that you know cope with a huge influx of people. And the sky doesn't fall down, and people get fed, and, and it's really not perfect. Um, but a whole lot more is possible, which is why when we talk about resettlement, I think the, the threshold is really not, you know, could we resettle 5,000 more people or 8,000 more people, but really, could we settle 10 or 20 or 30 times more people? I think in extremis, of course, of course we could. And I think it would be very valuable to shift the political conversation so that the argument is about um, much, much, much larger numbers. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, prosperous Western states have very little understanding of what this problem actually is. Yeah, you. you're welcome. Okay. Hi, um, my question has two parts, and the first part is because you mentioned that the uh, there are 140 plus countries uh, signatories of uh, signatory of uh, that uh, refugee law. Yeah. Um, and so the question is that. Is there any monitoring or any apart from their, you know, the moral obligation that when they sign that 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 document and then how they actually perform? Because I was reading a report before coming here, published by the Washington Post, that uh, India um, uh, arrested Rohingyas who were the, who were leaving uh, Myanmar in droves, yeah. uh, unfortunately, and they are arrested and deported, and they they were considered as illegal immigrants by the Indian government. 
Um, that's that's one thing. So is any is any is just they signed a document and then they implemented it the way they like. Is any monitoring or any? Uh, the second part is that for Canada, the Canada uh, has meets that obligation, except those uh, people making claims. And then uh, is there any anybody watching that? How those claims are processed? They could be, you know, if if they internally decide, okay, we we can just kind of get rid of these people. They can be very sloppy and uh, you know, and and they can. So it's. So there is remarkably, there's no monitoring in the Refugee Convention, which is um, astonishing. And it's a, it's a little bit because in the evolution of international human rights treaties, it's a pretty old one. Like the UN Declaration of Human Rights comes along before the Refugee Convention um, and the International Convention on Civil Political Rights. But the, the revolution in contemporary international human rights law that leads to two things, one, a reporting requirement by states, and two, a capacity for individuals to bring complaints of states, um, really doesn't happen until the 1960s, 1970s. So, the, so newer human rights law all has this monitoring feature. I'm, I'm not sure it's working particularly well, but in the Refugee Convention, there's no monitoring at all. In fact, the only way that an official complaint could be brought to the Refugee Convention is that if one state party took another state party to the International Court of Justice. But of course, there's no incentive for any state to have an international court look at what it means to comply with the Refugee Convention. So the lowest common denominator approach protects all states. So you're absolutely right. There's really no scrutiny at all. But it is an interesting, there are occasionally, um, uh, like the University of Michigan's Refugee Law Group has done some re report card work. Um, and I think it would be a really interesting project to try and set up like an international monitoring report card as a, a like an independent NGO uh, university combined project. And yes, uh, I mean, India has, has uh, a particularly, in a world with many bad records, India really stands out. Um, uh, but in some ways, the it's not. That is again like your your um, a colleague in the front row here. There's a volume question there, right? So um, Canada sits very far away from any refugee flows and deals with a very small number and has uh, a lot of resources and a um, a very. Um, good, it used to be much better, but still good, standard for refugee status determinations in countries. So it's easy to look comparatively good here. And if we were going to partner up and do an international report card, I think we would have to have a, like a, a factor in there that says, how good do you do compared to how many people you actually are trying to take care of, as opposed to how well do you do compared to some hypothetical standard. Because um, there's not, uh, there's very little monitoring in Canada that is, uh, that occurs systematically. It's possible to take a variety of different challenges to the courts in Canada, and that's sometimes effective. So there is a court challenge on to the Safe Third Country Agreement, which um, may or may not be successful, but will bring some degree of scrutiny to Canada's, uh, to whether or not that agreement is actually respectful of international refugee law, which arguably it isn't, yeah. But it's a very good point. Hi, I'll stand up so you can see me. Yes, thank uh, you. What about um, children's rights, uh, refugee children? So just recently um, I read that um, a child is being, sep a refugee child is being separated from her mother because um, if she returned, if the child returns back, she'd be subject to um, mu um, uh, mutilation. Mm -hmm. Um, but the mother has to go back. So is there any, is there a gap in the law there, how, in Canada? Yes, absolutely, there's a gap in the law. Refugee determinations are individually determined, and that's, um, uh, and Canada long ago, along with most other Western states, decided that it would be comfortable with separating children from their parents, and of, privatizing that choice of saying, well, it's really going to be the mother's choice, that the mother, if the mother is being um, 
well, let's not go inside the how the mother's being removed. If the mother's being removed and she has to return, she would be given the choice of whether or not to take the child with her. And um, rather than take on that responsibility, the law, the law downloads it to the individual at this stage. And that is um, definitely a gap in, in Canadian law and is a gap that is replicated uh, in, well, I won't say every Western liberal democracy, but certainly in Australia and the United States, in the UK, where I actually know the answer to the question. So I, would, I don't think it would be a huge leap to say, in general, this is the approach that Western states take, uh, which is not to say that's not the same, um, it's not the same problem as we've seen on the southern border of the United States about children being separated from their parents as they come into the country, because that is, uh, has different features and is the state taking the lead there, but it's not very different for the state to privatize that decision to the individual level. It just is not aggregated and very often hidden. Yeah. Any other questions? Simple is okay too. Just curiosities, <laughs> right? Does yeah. Can I just yeah. add on to that? So there's no kind of best interest determination in the legal process when you're dealing with a child. So like in child oh, protection, de there definitely is a best interest of the child uh, provision, but um, uh, that's one of the most malleable pieces of the law. And um, one of the things that, uh, a long time ago, but I doubt it would have changed, like about a decade ago, I did a study of um, all humanitarian and compassionate determinations that were publicly available in Canada. So that's really a very small subset of them. And we do have a provision in our law that says best interests of the child must always be considered when we're looking at any situation related to deportation. Um, and uh, we coded these 900-odd uh, cases for all sorts of different factors to see if children or the particular interests of children discussed in a decision. So we didn't know everything, but we had about 1,000 cases. And it turned out that children were absolutely irrelevant as a predictor of decision making. And the single thing that was the greatest predictor was how much money the person was making. And so people who were well-established economically like, just think about this, because this is actually horrifying. Um, people who were well-established economically were most likely to benefit from what was called compassion in the decision-making process. And if you think hard about that, you realize that that's kind of perverse. Actually, you don't have to think that hard. It's sort of perverse on the surface. Um, <laughs> that people who were most economically established and therefore objectively the least needy were most likely to, to benefit from this. So it has turned out that although we've put that provision um, into the law, it's not making a whole lot of difference, sadly. We could work on publicizing that a lot more, I think. Well, okay. I think that's it for questions. But are you going to be here for a few minutes afterwards oh, yes. if people have follow-up? So feel free to do that. OK, um, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Let's thank Catherine for So again, thank you to both Catherine and Aaron for, for the, this evening's uh, talk and discussion. And um, I wanted to say a couple of things uh, as we conclude tonight. Uh, first off, we have our uh, next and final in this three-part series taking place on November 14th. And um, Shashi Curl from Angus Reid um, Institute is going to speak on, I know what you think about immigration. So if you're interested in this topic, please uh, register and, and join us on November 14th. You can register again by going on issbc.org backslash closer look and, and register. So tell your colleagues, your friends, your family, uh, if you're interested in that topic, please uh, rejoin us on November 14th. There's also some, still some refreshments and food at the back there, so if you want to grab something before you leave, uh, please do so. And again, thank you very much for coming out tonight.